Hello, I'm Andy Stevenson and welcome to another episode of A Winning Mindset, Lessons from the Paralympics, a podcast brought to you by the International Paralympic Committee and long-standing partner Allianz. We want you to gain some new perspectives on the world and use what you hear from my Paralympic guests to help you in your own personal or professional lives. In this episode, I'll be speaking to Australian goalball player Mika Horsberg. She was born with a vision impairment and as a youngster survived a period of bullying which drove her to the brink. We'll be discussing those dark times and the importance of mental health as she now captains the Aussie Bells goalball team. Just a warning that we do discuss being bullied to the point of suicidal feelings. So if you think this could be triggering for you, then please bear that in mind if you choose to carry on listening. So Mika, hello. How has lockdown been for you in uh, in Brisbane, Australia? In Brisbane, we're actually pretty lucky. Um, I have a fair bit of freedom. We've had a little bit of lockdown at the start of, you know, when COVID all first started. In the last couple of months, we haven't had too much. When people hear about uh, vision impairments, I think sometimes they don't realise that there are varying degrees. So just in your own ordinary life, not necessarily sport at this point, can you describe the extent and and the type of your vision impairment? Yes. So I um, uh, have ocular cutaneous albinism. So for the general public, also known as an albino. So my vision, I'm pretty lucky. I have pretty good vision, but When you break it down, it's actually only 10% of what a normal person would see. So on an eye chart, it is the top letter um, and they call that 660. So what a ordinary person would see at 60 metres, I can only see at six. And are you seeing colours, shapes, light, everything like that okay or is there an impact there? I can see shapes, colour, everything. I've got peripheral vision as well. Things that are hard for me in everyday life is sort of, obviously, I can't drive. I struggle with public transport, but I also rely on it as well. So seeing bus numbers, um, obviously, computer screens and stuff, I have to have a lot larger. Uh, Sometimes recognising people is a lot of fun. Um, (laughs) Most people think I'm just being rude, but no, I just can't see you. And the albinism, again, some people listening will know exactly what that is. Others, Others won't. So could you just explain that to us? Yeah, so there are different types of albinism. There's ocular albinism, which is just um, the eye condition, and then there's skin and eyes. So it just means you've got no pigment in your skin or your eyes. With the eye condition, you are very light sensitive. So going out in sunlight, it hurts and it's, it is really hard to see. A lot of people also have nystagmus, which means your eyes move back and forth. So if you look into someone's eyes, they're just darting like from left to right. I think one of the the really interesting things is that two of your siblings also have albinism and two don't, I believe. So what was that like for you all growing up, you know, that mixture of those of you who could see perfectly and those of you who couldn't? Growing up, it wasn't too bad. Um, It's funny how I I do describe them if I'm having to talk to people who don't necessarily, like they know of my brothers and sisters. I call them the brown sister or the white sister (laughs) and they... (laughs) They seem to understand that. Um, Mum and dad treated us all very equally and, you know, they really concentrated on the things that we could do and not what we couldn't. So didn't really stand out, I suppose, in a, in a way when it came to things because we'd just get out there and do it until, you know, later on in life when things started to get a little bit harder. Now, I'm disabled myself, you know, I think children just go oh okay yeah that person's different we'll, we'll carry on I mean I'm talking about sort of young children here not kind of teenagers yeah, really young. yeah and so I guess as a family you just all sort of rubbed along yeah one gang uh, I think I probably got picked on the most I was the baby <laughs> <laughs> have you always been an ambitious person or did you worry that your life might be limited in some way um I would probably say always pretty ambitious always got out there and did things. Um, It wasn't until I sort of got older when fear got in the way of a lot. Yeah, I would say pretty ambitious. I read a quote from you just recently, actually, where you said, after finding goalball, and we'll talk about goalball uh, later on, that's your Paralympic sport. After finding goalball, I found my place in life. What did you mean by that? Before I did say that uh, growing up was sort of easier. So as you said, um, when you're a young child, you do sort of just fit in. But then um, when you get to high school, you know, people start to realise things a little bit. And um, I, in my teenage years, I really struggled. Um, I got teased a lot in high school. 
I hated life. I hated myself. I didn't know why I was the one that was different. You know, I think a lot of people with a disability go through that at some stage, you know, why me? And then, yeah, it wasn't until I found Goalball that I really realised, you know, I, I do fit in somewhere and I do have something to add to the world. You say teasing, but would you describe actually as bullying? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And how bad did that bullying get? Yeah, it got pretty bad. Um, I would say it was it was daily. It was you know I got called a lot of names. Um, Casper, one of them, um, obviously because my skin is very white. Um, I do stand out. Even someone once said, "Oh, you know, tell your mum to bleach her clothes and not her children." Even my own brother, which is funny enough because he's also um, has albinism, told me once to wrap a, a string around my head and act like a tampon. <laughs> So I've, I've had everything um, and, yeah, it got to the point where I honestly I just hated life and to me there was nothing really to live for and I did uh, around the age of 18, uh, 13, sorry, foolishly did try to take my own life and then, you know, it was took a little while and even throughout my first little bit through goalball I still struggled a lot um, but I, I really do think that sport saved me. Why do you think the bullies do this kind of thing why do you think people decide that it's okay to to tease and uh, abuse others I don't know I think yeah they they might be lacking something in their own life um, they struggle with things so it's easier to take it out on other people um, they think they're funny and everyone you know people will laugh at them they'll become the cool kid how were you dealing with it at the time? You know, who were you turning to and what were you doing to just try and get through every day? Um, I suppose I didn't really turn to anybody. I was angry. I was angry a lot of the time, angry enough to at one point I actually, um, I did get into a bit of a fight. I'm not proud of it, but I, yeah, I punched somebody uh, and I, yeah, I was just angry at the world. Like I got so angry that at the time I, it was like I wasn't even in my own body. Um, I was on the outside looking in and that really scared me. I didn't want to feel like that. I didn't want to do that again. And, um, yeah, I guess I didn't really know how to talk about it. After obviously trying to take my own life, I did get a little bit of counselling. I think that, that sort of helped. What pulled you back, if you don't mind me asking, kind of what pulled you back from the brink of that suicide attempt when you were just 13? I don't know if there is anything in particular, but goal ball and, you know, getting my frustrations out on court and like finding a place where I fit in, you know, knowing going there and knowing you're not alone. There are other people going through the same things as you. You aren't so different to other people. Yeah, you might stand out, but, you know, you, you belong. And just trying to change my mindset, I think, really helped. And how were your family reacting to all of this and, and that attempt to take your own life? Yeah, it wasn't good. Um, yeah, m- mum and dad have been through a lot of a lot of crap <laughs> through like the five children, um, especially like my eldest brother. Um, he had he's the one with albinism, and he had a pretty hard childhood too. He didn't try and take his life, but he was a very angry sort of kid. He didn't um, get through high school. So I think we all put them through a lot of crap. Yeah, they really struggled. Now being older, definitely, I'm so thankful for them. Um, I wouldn't be the person I am today without them. And I always make sure that, you know, that they know that I do love them and I'm thankful for everything they've done for me. When you look back on it now, what, around 15 years later as an adult, how would you support someone else going through similar? My niece, she doesn't have albinism, but, you know, she often talks about herself and how she hates certain things about herself. Like, I'm too tall and I hate myself and all this. And I just try to make her understand, you know what, that's you. That makes you unique and you should love yourself because we all belong. We all um, have a place in the world. And, you know, if we were all the same, we'd all it'd be so boring. <laughs> so I just try and make them anyone understand or myself understand that, you should love yourself. And one of my biggest or favourite quotes is, why try so hard to fit in when you were born to stand out? And I've, I've loved that ever since, you know, I've I found that strength to really just, I suppose, love myself and know I fit in. And there is so much to love about the world. 
That's a fantastic quote. And actually, I mean, the Paralympics is all about and increasingly about inclusion, social inclusion, diversity. And this kind of feeds into what you're saying, isn't it? About, about you know, stand out. Don't, don't just try and fit in with everyone else. Be proud of your differences. Yeah, definitely. Do you feel, uh, obviously now, you know, you're a Paralympian, you're, you're captain of the Australian goalball team, which we'll talk about in a moment. You're, to a certain extent, a personality in Australia. Do you, do you feel actually like this is your, I don't want to say revenge, but this is, this is you sort of being able to turn around to the bullies wherever they are now and go, well, look, this is, this is how successful I've been in my life. Yeah, definitely. Um, I I'm really proud of how far I've come and it definitely is a bit of that. And I think um, also to a lot of my teachers um, growing up, I, I was a terrible child and I feel sorry for them. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of them, I, I think, wrote me off as well. They just saw me as a bad child and oh, we can't deal with her or whatever. And it's, it's so good now to, yeah, be able to say, look, you know, I, I was bad, but I also came out of it and look how much I have achieved. So yeah, definitely. Would you say that goalball saved your life? Yes, 100%. I think if I didn't find it, um, I don't know where I would be today. I don't think I would be alive. If it wasn't me trying to commit suicide, um, I definitely would have gone down the wrong path, I think. So when when was it that you found goalball and and how did that come about? Um, So I started playing a little bit of it at school when I was about 14. At school, we started playing a little bit of it and then uh, started playing socially on the weekend. And then how I got into the team, I suppose, one of the girls that I actually went to school with, she was in the Australian team at the time and the coach asked me to come along to a, a training camp. And for those people, again, listening who might not know goalball, can you just give us a very sort of brief, basic rundown of what the sport is and how a match is played? Yeah, so goalball is specifically for blind and vision impaired athletes. Um, Everybody is blindfolded to make it equal. So you can have vision or you can have no vision. And having the blindfold is also a safety thing, but also makes us all play on the same playing field. You have a 1.25 kilogram ball with bells in it. And then you play on an indoor volleyball court that's 18 by 9 metres and you have a goal at each end and there's three people, three players up each end and you've got to roll the ball, bounce the ball and try and get it past the opposition at the other end who defend the ball by basically chucking themselves on the ground to stop the ball from going in the goal. It's a fantastic sport. I've seen a fair bit of it myself at Paralympic Games and as you say, it, there's, there's that interesting thing, isn't there, of the ball having the bell in, so the crowd have to be essentially silent, don't they, whilst you're playing? Yeah, sometimes it's not the best spectator sport because um, you, you can't go crazy um, as much as you want to. But, yeah, it is really good to watch once you understand it. I think it adds, as you say, the crowd can't go crazy, but actually I think there's something brilliant about the, the tension in the crowd. It's like watching, you know, snooker or to a certain extent golf or something where you have to be kind of quiet at key moments and and everybody's sort of focused on the court it's uh, it's quite something and you referred to it earlier I wanted to ask you about the sensations you're feeling when you're playing goalball because in ordinary life you know you're wandering around you're working you're at home you're doing normal things with with your vision on court you wear as you said you you all wear eye masks so does that actually change what you're sensing compared to your life off the court? Yeah, a little bit. Um, you can't see things, so you do have to visualise them. You do have to listen a lot harder than you would in, I think, everyday life. Definitely when people are talking to you as well, and especially the coach, and it's something that you have to learn with your coach, like really get a understanding of how they deliver messages because you don't have that those visual cues of oh, is he mad at me or something like that so you definitely your senses are a lot more now your team are known as the Aussie Bells and you made your international debut at just 15 years old now given everything we've spoken about already that's that's just two years after the whole bullying episode and your suicide attempt I mean do you ever sit back and think that is extraordinary to have gone from that to that in two years. Yes, definitely. But um, also, I mean, it's a huge achievement. um, But I I think at the time, goalball wasn't very big in Australia. Um, We lost a few players after 2000 uh, because we lost a lot of funding. So we didn't really have a team. So I was very lucky. I probably now definitely wouldn't get on the team. So 
yes, I, I think I worked hard, but I also, I was also very lucky to get on the team at that point in my life. Very modest. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure that's modest. <laughs> um, you might not be able to tell this really, but do people treat you differently now you're an athlete representing your country or do you think that there will still be people out there poking fun at you and your teammates or trying to belittle you in some some way oh I definitely think there would be a lot of people out there who would um unfortunately disability is just one of those things that I mean we have come a long way but it is one of those things people will always make fun of people. They'll look at them because they are different. The majority of people, yes, would highly regard you, I suppose, um, because you are an athlete. But, you know, in everyday life, you. So I have a tattoo on my back that is the Olympic rings and also the uh, Gitos. And people will always come up to you, oh, my God, were you in the Olympics? Oh, yeah, I, was, I competed in the Paralympics. And, you know, they just give you a, a little smile and then walk away like they're not interested. And I think... We've got a very long way to go for people to realise, you know what, that is just as as good as competing in the Olympics and having people really look at you with the admiration, I suppose. Do you think the Paralympic movement, if you want to call it that, is gradually changing people's attitudes? Because that is that is quite a big goal of, of the International Paralympic Committee. Yeah, I, I think it is, um, especially even in the years that I've been involved, the Paralympic movement has dramatically changed. Um, but I think we have still have a very, very long way to go. It's been quite a roller coaster for the Aussie Bells in terms of, of Paralympic Games because you didn't manage to qualify for Beijing, but you became captain in 2010 and you led the team to London 2012 which was your first Paralympics and and the team's first since Sydney after London we'll come back to London in a moment but then Rio you get in right at the last minute don't you because you replaced Russia so it's been a real up and down for you in terms of the the Paralympic uh, progress but let's focus on London a second how special was that to be to be captaining that team oh it was absolutely amazing it was a dream come true I loved sport growing up and I always thought I'd actually be in the Olympics, but um, obviously, uh, you know, find a goal ball, uh, it turned into the Paralympics and it was something that I worked so hard for and to get there and then, yeah, to be captain of the team. It's so hard to put that into wor words, um, walking out in the opening ceremony, you know, with the team by my side was just something I'll never, ever forget. And it's tough, isn't it? Because Australia are a kind of emerging country in terms of goal ball. You know, the, the global superpowers of goal, goal ball are elsewhere. And, and London 2012, in terms of the actual matches themselves, were, were a struggle, to, to be honest, weren't they, for Australia? So how difficult was it to cope with that? Or was the, was the excitement and pride at being qualified for that Games enough to kind of carry you through? Look, we weren't even really supposed to qualify for London. Um, we didn't have a lot of funding or the APC didn't really pick up us as a managed sport until 2010. And their goal was to get us to Rio. So um, for us to actually qualify for London was such an achievement. Uh, I think we set, we didn't go into thinking that, you know, we were going to medal. To win one game would have been fantastic. I think we did as well as we could have. Our first game was actually up against Japan, who ended up winning. Yeah, they won gold and we only lost to them 2-0. So I think all round, I think it was a pretty amazing achievement for us. Absolutely. And being captain, what kind of things are you doing as, as skipper <laughs> uh, with that responsibility to help your, your teammates? I uh, don't think I really do anything much different. I believe we all sort of have a role to play and I try to more just lead by example, even in everyday life, in, in training and things like that, and just try and be a positive influence on the girls. I just need not for them to know that I'm there if they need me and especially when, say, the coaches can't be. Yeah, I try not to do too much more, if that makes sense. 
I think you're probably being modest there again. But in, in my head, I kind of think, you know, you came into the squad yourself as a 15 year old. So do you feel a responsibility to look after particularly the younger players, you know, and and maybe be there for them as a sort of shoulder to, to cry on or be looking, you know, are you looking out for their mental health as well? I definitely try to. But um, if I'm completely honest with you, I think a lot of people find me intimidating. Sometimes I think it's hard. I think some of the girls, they get a little intimidated by me, I think, because I have played for so long. They know I am there, but I think sometimes they do get a little intimidated. (laughs) And on court, I mean, are you intimidating on court? Are you quite a vocal captain in that respect? Because intimidating is not necessarily bad, is it? We can all think of our favourite sports and we can all think of famous captains in various sports who are well known for, you know, they're not exactly nice on the court, but it's not necessarily a bad thing when you're playing playing a, an elite level sport. Yeah, like I wouldn't think that is a bad thing, but, you know, some some people do. That It sort of happens to me in everyday life as well. Um, people just think I, I am a little bit intimidating. I think it's because I'm a little bit bigger. But um, <laughs> I think I am a little bit intimidating on court. I try not to show a, a lot of emotion. And if it is emotion, it probably is more of the, you know, let's get out there and get it done. Like the angry, not angry, but you know what I mean. That sort of emotion. Do you know where the line is? I mean, particularly given everything we talked about, you know, that you, you went through when you were younger, Presumably that's given you quite a sense of, you know, I'm going to be tough where I need to be tough, but I'm not going to let it become anything worse than that. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, And definitely have my fair share of uh, cries (laughs) when I need to. And I know that you've wanted to be, you know, you've wanted to take the Aussie Bells to to a real position of strength. You know, you've been captain, you've competed at two Paralympic Games. Looking ahead to, to Tokyo, is your determination to improve still just as strong as ever? Yes, definitely. Uh, I want it to be, because for me, Tokyo will definitely be my last uh, Paralympics. I most likely will not go on to Paris. So knowing it is your last, you've got to give it 110%. And I mean, you always do, but yeah, I want us to do as well as we can. Like ultimately getting on that podium would be amazing. But for us to just go out there and beat our positions for the last two Paralympics would just be amazing. But it's hard, you know, you're playing against the top teams in the world. A lot of them are funded. A lot of them, they are have live-in programs and we're playing against, I suppose, professionals in a way. So it, it will be hard, but definitely going to put in everything I can to see where this team can go. Now, goalball has extended into your personal life because you married fellow goalball player John Horsberg in 2012. How did that come about? I'm sure you were sort of training in squads together and that kind of thing, was it? Yeah, so um, he actually lived in a different state to me. So he lived in Melbourne and I lived in Brisbane. Uh, and we saw each other a couple, once a month, I suppose, at training camps. And then uh, we travelled obviously together to a couple of tournaments and yeah fell in love are you similar characters oh in some ways yes in some ways no (laughs) definitely determined um and that's what I guess I love about John is that we are determined to sort of get where we need to to and in sport so well we have a little surprise for you take a listen to this Mika it has been a privilege to be a part of your journey so far from all the ups and downs that have been brought upon you from goalball and life it is amazing to see how you have grown as a person and most of all how you strive to achieve your goals that you set out with planning day-to-day activities to make sure that these goals are achieved i am honored to be a part of this journey with you and wish you all the success that you are striving for Oh, that's cute. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and he's not he's not sat there in the same room with you to saying that. <laughs> just no. To, just to clarify. <laughs> Do you feel there's a special kind of quality to to you as a couple, not not just because you're both goalball players, but actually because you're both vision impaired? You know, do you feel like you sort of take on the world together a little bit? Yeah. Um, yes and no. Um, it also it has a lot of challenges, uh, both being vision impaired, not being able to drive. You know, it is harder to get places um, and especially, you know, things that you love doing, like you can't do it as easy. So you can't just go and have camping trips and things like that. But yeah, definitely, you know, life is easier. Also having a partner that understands 
the challenges you will, you face in life. I did hear a rumor, by the way. I forgot to ask earlier, but I heard a rumor that you you prepare for gold ball matches by listening to loud music and being quotes silly before games. Is that true? <laughs> yes, I, I definitely have done that a lot of that in the past. Yes. <laughs> so what does that involve? What, what's being silly before a game? Doing anything to get my mind off the game. I don't really like to think about what's about to happen. Um, I know that probably sounds a little bit weird, but uh, our team has this. I suppose it's not really a ritual, but before our games, we'll play some drama games. So one of the girls in the team is actually a drama teacher, and they do games and things in school so she likes to bring out new ones every now and again and we'll play those and that they are a little bit silly and the it's funny because the Japan team actually <laughs> heard us doing one one day and now whenever they see us they're always yelling out ha huh? which is one of the games that we play <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant so that's just a way of sort of taking your mind off things uh, avoiding any pre-match nerves and what's your what's your go-to music track in the in the changing room before a match Oh, well, it used to be the final countdown because it actually was played a lot in 2010 at our World Championships in Sheffield. Well, that's kind of gone off the playlist. It got a bit boring. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the music I like is probably a bit of Jimmy Barnes. You probably don't know who he is, but yeah, just some easy listening music, but more pump up, if that makes sense. Mm, absolutely. But yeah. not Screamo. I don't like Screamo. <laughs> What's Screamo? I've, I'm, I'm going to make myself sound very old here. What's Screamo? I don't know what it's technically called, but when people just sit there and go, ah, yeah. <laughs> so a little bit more reserved than that. <laughs> yeah. And just to finish, I mean, we, we obviously talked about some heavy stuff at the beginning. What would you say to the bullies now if you could go back? Nothing you say was going to get in my way. And what about if somebody is listening to this who, you know, they might be young they might not be young they might be going through some sort of period of of bullying or harassment in some way what would you say to them from your own experience your life might be hard now but you will get through it you will rise above it and life is definitely worth living you just need to find the strength to carry on and find your place in the world and whatever that may be just go out there and shine well, Mika, thank you so much for being so uh, candid and, and honest about about everything, but particularly those tough years you had. We definitely wish you luck in Tokyo. When are you allowed to sort of train again properly with, with the rest of your team? Uh, good question. Um, <laughs> I'm not actually too sure. Every month we say, yeah, we're going to have a training camp this month and then, it, you know, something new happens. So uh, we were supposed to have a training camp next month and at this stage it doesn't look likely, so... I'm really unsure. A bit rusty when you when you start back, do you think? Oh no, I'll be great. I'm, I'm I can train. I can train here. So uh, in Queensland, we're we're still training normal training. But uh, <laughs> I feel sorry for the other girls because they're going to have to put up with me. <laughs> I'm sat here thinking, imagining if I was one of your teammates, and uh, I'm already feeling like you're going to push push me hard when we get back. But that's great. I sure will. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Mika. Thanks for your time. Awesome. Thank you. Well, powerful words there throughout from Australian goalball player Mika Horsberg. If you or someone you know has been affected by anything you've heard in the last half hour or so, then advice can be found at paralympic.org slash mental health. These podcasts have been created by the International Paralympic Committee and Alliance because we believe the stories of these unique athletes can help you in your own life and give you a new perspective. We certainly hope that's the case today. Mika illustrated the power of sport in finding a place to belong and to help heal some of the wounds of being bullied. And for me, what came across most strongly was how Mika changed her mindset from trying to fit in to allowing herself to stand out and shine. Thank you again to her for being so candid. Next week, my guest will be French wheelchair basketball player Grace Wembalua. As a child, she survived an arson attack on her home, but it was a fire which killed her mother and brother and Grace herself suffered extensive burns and had to have both legs amputated. She'll be talking to us about body confidence and coming to accept her injuries and scars, to the point now where she is a model and beauty ambassador with a huge social media following. Don't miss that one, and please do rate, review and subscribe to this podcast. Bye for now.